Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this morning again. We thank you for the opportunity to discuss your servant, Martin Luther, Lord God. I pray that we would learn much from his life, learn from his teaching as well, Lord God, that you would cause us to leave this place with a love of Scripture equal to that of Martin Luther, Lord God, which is a, a weighty thing to pray. But I pray that we would love it as much as he did, that we would search it as much as he did, that we would proclaim it as much as he did. And all these things we pray to Christ, to you, our Father, in Christ, our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. <sighs> the build-up. It's, it's finally here. It's finally here. The whole course is built one around this one lecture. Um, amen. Yeah. I will tell you, it was originally 60 slides, uh, and I realized that I can't do that in an hour, so I managed to get it to 22. Uh, may God forgive me. Uh, you will notice, so you're reading, your notes are different this week. Uh, instead, because I had to cut so much out, I did a, did a pretty lengthy Luther lecture about four years ago, so I gave you my 12-page notes on that. That'll actually give you a pretty good sketch of his entire life, some and of his thought. So you'll notice the notes are different today. Also, the readings. The readings are a little heftier. I gave you uh, one of his most famous books, the, the entire thing, The Freedom of a Christian, which every Christian should read. And then behind it, you'll find the 95 Theses, if you're interested in that, since that's, that incident is really where we mark the beginning of the Reformation. And then also his um, Theses from the Heidelberg Disputation which reveals a lot of his theology. A note on sources, there are over 500 biographies of Martin Luther. Over 500. Uh, kind of the gold standard one that Christians and seminary go to, and really secular as well, is by a guy named Roland Bainton called Here I Stand. It's a fantastic biography. Another one that I really like by a guy who was the leading Luther scholar of his day is Heiko Obermann's Luther, Man Between God and Devil. It's a fantastic book. And if you're feeling really sporty, the definitive biography in English and in German is by Martin Brecht. It is three volumes. Each volume is about 500 pages. Um, it is fascinating, but it is dense. And God bless him for writing it. Okay. What? Oh, I thought, I thought someone said, yes, I'll buy it. I think it's from Fortress Press. Okay. What do you think Martin Luther's early life was like? It was like. I can imagine he was not a good child. Not a good child, okay. <laughs> Probably a handful. Probably a handful, okay. What else? What, what was the timeline? So remember, last, last week we discussed the 15th century, we discussed John Huss. We're talking medieval Europe here at that, and they don't know it yet because we've, we've given these differentiations, but they're, we're at the end of the medieval period as we reckon it. What is the world like? In Germany. They can't read. Okay, they can't read. We talked about this before. Only only 5% of rural people can read. Do you think Martin Luther lives in a city or in the country? Basically the country, right? In a small town. The largest city in Luther's Germany, the largest city, has 40,000 people. Right? That's the size of Lufkin, Texas, if you've ever been there. It, is, it thinks it's a big place, but it's not. Okay, 40,000 people. That's the largest city in Germany. Today, I think Germany has over 100 cities, uh, over 40,000 people. I mean, Texas has 100 cities, over 40,000 people. So it's rural. It's largely illiterate, uneducated. And that's the life he's born into. Martin Luther was born in this house, 10 November, 1483, in Eisleben. I think that's where, if you saw John Ellis' socks from last week, I think that's where he got them. At least that's what his wife told mine. Uh, his father was a copper miner, and he was an entrepreneur. This is the time when the commercial economy in the centuries before this is really taking off. So we're transitioning from, a, from feudalism, which we've talked about before, where people are tied to the land, and basically all of production is geared towards agriculture, and we're actually in a market economy now, and, ha and uh, Hans Luther really gets involved in that. One of the reasons is Germany has a weird law to where, you know, in England, if you're the oldest son, you inherit everything. In Germany, if you're the youngest son, you inherit the land. So 
Martin Luther's father, Hans, was not the youngest son, so he had to go find something else to do. And he actually became a pretty productive copper miner. So is this kind of like a precursor to like what we call the Puritan work ethic, where we see as we're coming out of feudalism in the secular age, we're just starting to kind of develop because we're more entrepreneurial? Uh, well, so Luther, so it's interesting you bring that up because Luther is is very big and he's really the first proponent of the idea of vocation. That guess what? Being a monk doesn't make you more holy. God calls you to be a carpenter and you can honor God in your carpentry. The, the Puritans really, really drive home. But Luther is actually the first one that he takes secular vocations and he puts them in religious terms. So uh, I don't think he's thinking that way, but definitely, I mean, he's coming out of this milieu of, and he has a respect for his father and for his father's class. Uh, shortly after he's born, they move to Mansfeld. And Hans plans for Martin to be a lawyer. So uh, Martin, I want to say, is the eldest. He might be the second eldest. But he realizes pretty quick that his son is sharp and he wants to send him to university and to be a lawyer because in this up-and-coming economy, everyone needs lawyers. Kings need lawyers, princes need lawyers, copper miners need lawyers. So becoming a lawyer is a way to really distinguish yourself in society, and that's what Hans wants for his son. So he wants him to be a lawyer. And so he sends Luther to a bunch of Latin schools. There's no such thing as public education. If you're born a farmer's kid, Probably going to be a farmer. You're definitely not going to school, and you're definitely not going to learn how to read. If you want to go to school, if you want to send your son to school so that he can get into the university, because remember, you have to speak what language to go to university? Latin. Latin. You got to pay that out of your own pocket. So Han says, "You know what, Martin? He's got what it takes. I'm going to pay to send him to university, and in order to do that, I've got to pay to send him basically to private school for him to learn Latin and the basics." And so Luther goes to three separate Latin schools as he's growing up. Why did he go to three? Uh, he moved around a little bit. I mean, his family did. He stayed with family in different areas as well. So, um, and again, if you if you read the Brecht book, it goes way into all the different family he had in those three places. Uh, in 1501, he entered the University of Erfurt. The following year, got his bachelor's degree. 1502. That's not advancing. Huh? That's not it. No! Hold on. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why you reduced it to one slide? Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, 1502, he gets his bachelor's degree. 1505, he gets his master's degree. Right, so he's, he's basically 22, and he has, or 21, and he has his master's degree. And so now he's ready. Remember, we talked about this like four weeks ago when we talked about the university. You've got to get your bachelor's and then your master's, and then you can move up to one of the higher faculties, so theology, law, or medicine. Right, so he's ready to enter law school. Isn't that a bit quick to get a bachelor's? It depended on what country you were in. So in Germany, not so much. So a year, a year was pretty standard. Three years for a master's pretty standard. Now it's his doctorate that's going to be the point of contention on that. So how does this guy, who he's, he's a dutiful son, right? So you said he's probably a handful. Really not, actually, because German parents um, were very, very strict. In fact, Luther once stole a nut, you know, a nut from a tree, and his mother beat him with, a, with like a tree branch until he bled. So, and he really loved his mom. His mom really loved him, right? But, I mean, uh, you know, there was, there was no tie knot corner. In the Germany. That's not how discipline was handled. So how does he go from this? So he's, he's got his master's degree. His dad has always wanted him to go into law, and he's about to start law school, July 1505. What happens? The tree. The, the tree? Lightning. Lightning, okay. Oh, falls off a horse. Falls off a horse. Oh! I do declare. So Luther dropped out of law school after a brush with lightning on July 2nd, 1505, right? So before this, in 1503, he was riding his horse with, uh, with a, basically like, you know, everyone carried around a knife. By the way, you didn't, 
you didn't go eat somewhere and they provide you a knife. You would carry a knife with you to actually eat, right? So every, everyone was packing, packing knives back in the day. Uh, he actually fell, he fell off his horse a weird way, cut an artery in his leg, and he almost bled to death. So that really started getting him thinking, because he was always a very kind of conscientious guy. It really got him thinking about, you know, death and where he's going after he died. Well, then in 1505, on his way back, so he visited his family. His dad was really proud of him, bought him a whole bunch of law books. Books are really, really expensive back then, right? I still would have been buying them to share a chagrin. <laughs> but they're very expensive. Instead, just bought him this whole set of law books. He's on his way back to university uh, outside of a town called Stodenheim. Uh, and he gets caught in a lightning storm. Who does he call out for? Anyone remember? Who does he call out for in the lightning storm? Saint Anne. Saint Anne, who is the patron saint of what? Copper. Miners. Saint Anne is the patron saint of miners. He says, "Help, Saint Anne! I will become a monk. Right? If you just save me from getting struck by lightning." You have to remember, lightning is not a random occurrence in his mind. There's nothing random about lightning. Lightning. You get struck by lightning. That is a judgment of God. So, he promises to become a monk. He obviously does not get fried by a lightning bolt. And so, being true to his word, on July 17th, so two weeks later, he joins the observant Augustinians in Erfurt. Dad, happy or not happy? Not, not happy. Super duper not happy. Never First off, he had spent all this money. He had spent all this money to send his son to school. He thought his son was disobeying him, right, which was not honoring his father and his mother. In fact, Luther later on in his life would say that him joining the monastery was actually a sin that he committed by disobeying his father. But Luther goes hardcore press. He could have joined the Franciscans or Dominicans or one of these easy orders. He goes for the toughest order in Erfurt he can find, the observant Augustinians. Uh, when you join the monastery, you spent your first year, you're not, you're not officially a monk yet. You have to kind of prove yourself and make sure this is really what you want. Because remember, once you join, there's no getting out. You can't just quit. You can run away, and then if someone catches you, they're going to send you right back. It's, it's like a, an enlistment that never ends. So he spent his first year as a novice and became a full monk in 1506. And in 1507, he's ordained a priest. Remember, not all monks are priests, but many of them are, right? So... He's a monk, so he, he joins 1505. Two years later, he's now a full monk. He is a full priest, and he is in his mid-twenties. Uh, and his, just like his father, uh, his leader in the Augustinian monastery recognizes that Luther's a pretty sharp guy. And so he basically forces him to go get a doctorate uh, in theology at the newly founded University of Wittenberg. Luther did not want to do this. Uh, his spiritual father, if you will, a guy named Johann Staupitz. Staupitz uh, told him, well, God needs you, so you're going to go. Uh, there's actually a fantastic quote about the whole thing in the notes that I've given you, probably on page like three or four. But he's forced to go get his doctorate in Wittenberg in 1508. Uh, I told you his leader recognized his gifts. And Staupitz really was like a father to Luther, uh, kind of the spiritual father he didn't have at Hans. Uh, and they were close until the, basically the start of the Reformation. And even in, at the beginning of the Reformation, they were still close. And then finally, Stalpitz, uh, towards the end of his life, him and uh, Luther stopped communicating. And in 1512, Luther earned his doctorate at age 28. That was a big scandal because he got fast-tracked for his doctorate. Normally, guys wouldn't have their doctorate until mid-30s to, to 40. Uh, There's kind of a time requirement. And Staupitz fast-tracked Luther, which created a lot of problems for Luther back in his home monastery because a lot of the other guys were saying, hey, what's going on with Luther? How's, how's he 28? And just to make matters worse, Luther, in October 1512, right after he gets his doctorate, replaces Staupitz as the chair of biblical theology at the University of Wittenberg. And that's where he remains until he dies. That's, Luther, Luther is not pastor of a church. Luther, Luther is a theologian. He is a university professor, and that is where he is until he dies. Yes? What is it about him that he is so easily educated, <laughs> smart, or whatever? Is he, a, he is a brilliant person on his own? Yes. Well, I mean, I, mean, I, don't, have, I don't have extensive uh, 
education and how the brain works. But just I would say I would say you know in my in my minimal experience of being a human, you can tell people that are smart by nature, people that are not smart by nature, and people that they have a pretty good computing system. You just got to plug stuff into it, and they're all right. And I and that's fine, right? God creates us all different ways for different purposes. I know some very godly people that I love to death that just by nature, I, they are just not intelligent. And that's fine. That's fine. There's nothing, you, you're not subhuman for that. At the same time, we've all met that one guy, and you're like, how are you so smart? And it's not just because they read a lot of books. They're just, things come to them quicker, just off the top of their head. I got a friend that's like this, that, I mean, he just makes me feel dumb every time I talk to him. Stop talking about <laughs> that's true. That's true. But that's not true. <laughs> I know. Even the propensity for language. I mean, if you're able to pick up Latin like that, that's. Yeah. And he's critiquing. He's critiquing his Latin professors too. Um, I think we talked about this last week. Luther doesn't actually learn Greek until Philip Melanchthon comes mm -hmm. to teach at Wittenberg, and he learns it in less than a year. It, and this is while he's busy doing the Reformation. I mean, Luther, Luther's a pretty sharp guy. And again, everyone kind of noticed that. He's also very conscientious. So when he joins the monastery, it's not because he wants kind of a cush life. Luther joins the monastery because he's afraid for his immortal soul. He true, and he, as a monk, he is, as a monk, he, he bores the death out of Stalpitz. Because sometimes he'll go and confess for three hours. Confess for three hours. He'll walk out. He'll think one bad thought, and he'll want to come back. Stalpitz actually has to kick him out and say, come back when you have something to really confess. <laughs> Seriously, really happened. I mean, he was that concerned with his soul. So he, he's got the intellect, plus he's got the, um, the will, if you will. Well, I mean, he, you know, he undertook translating the Bible himself into German from Latin. And yeah, do you remember how long it takes him? Was it a little? So it takes so it takes from the time he starts uh -huh. to the time they publish it, it takes eleven months. Right, 11. But the first translation actually only takes him three months. Yeah, so that's not someone who's lackadaisical about their no. work ethic. And, and if you've ever taken a you know, so I've taken a lot of foreign language, I'm not really good at any of them, yeah. right? But I'll tell you whether it's German, it's Greek, it's Hebrew, it's Spanish, translating stuff from one language to another, even if you know both languages fluently, is not an easy thing. Because language isn't, isn't concrete like that. For example, if you said, don't put the cart before the horse, and you translated that in German, it doesn't make sense. Right? It makes sense to us because it's an idiom we use and we know what it means. In German, it doesn't mean that. They have a different expression for that. And so when you translate from, from Greek, from this 2000, or for him, 1500-year-old Greek, and you try and put it in contemporary German, that's a difficult thing. The dude does it in three months, and it's still the authoritative Protestant Bible that they use in Germany. It's absolutely insane. And let's remember, when he did it, he had only known Greek for like two or three years at the same time. Absolutely incredible. Uh, he was, at the same time, he was also elected district vicar for his monastery, for his order, which means he actually supervised 11 different monasteries. Under so he, he had Stalpitz and then he was district vicar where he went around. So Luther was a busy man in any age. So he writes a letter in which he talks about how he preaches regularly, he teaches at the university, he supervises eleven monasteries, and he still has to do all his monk duties. Remember the the canonical hours, the seven times a day that you're supposed to pray and to offer mass. I put the quote in your notes, but Luther basically writes a letter at this time to one of his friends saying all this stuff he does, and then he ends it with, how lazy I am. <laughs> uh, and with Luther, Luther's kind of a <laughs> prone to exaggeration at times. But, you know, I'm very inclined to believe he really did think he was not doing enough. Because, again, his whole theology leading up to the Reformation is, I have to work to get to heaven. That's why he spends three hours in a confessional. And bores. I think that's why Stalpitz really sent him to Wittenberg, the doctor, just to get him out of the confession. <laughs> um, but that being said, Stalpitz also, also is really the one, and Luther even credits him with pointing him to Christ. So Stalpitz, Stalpitz is is you know not just some late medieval guy. He's he's reading all of the the modern stuff. 
you know, part of the humanist movement, going back to the Bible. And, and Staupitz really recognizes Luther's need to go to the Bible and to see Christ not as a judge, but as a savior. And Luther always thanks Staupitz, even after they kind of break up contact, for that kind of revelation. So what made this university professor, this, this devout monk, what made this guy the Catholic Church's public enemy number one? Indulgences. indulgences. And what are indulgences? A really good Money. economy. Okay, a great yeah. economy, okay. What? The way the Pope builds the... Uh... But in general, what is an indulgence? Getting time off your sentence of purgatory. Yeah. Okay, or someone else's? Yeah. Hey. Someone else's? Okay. Yeah, so, first off, yeah, it's great for the economy, Daniel. <laughs> it, it's basically, I, you come and you say, hey, I want to get my grandfather out of purgatory. Now, with indulgences, there's supposed to be true contrition and prayer and all that. But what really ends up happening most of the time is you come, and I give you a piece of paper that's got the <laughs> seal of the, the bishop who's authorized by the Pope to do this indulgence, and they, we write the name of your grandfather in there, and then you pay a little bit of money, right? It's your little donation, and I give you the piece of paper, and everyone feels good, and you can get out of purgatory. <clears throat> and that's actually going to be a really important thing to lose. Why? Because the guy is obsessed with, am I going to hell or not? But first, the situation. So indulgences. The two principal players, Pope Leo X and a guy named Albrecht of Mainz. So Pope Leo, he really wants to build St. Peter's Basilica. If you, want to see the, if you want to see the building that built the Reformation, it's St. Peter's in Rome. <laughs> and, I mean, if you just look at St. Peter's, I mean, it, it's, it's classic late medieval, early modern architecture. It's, it's grandeur at its grandest scale. And Pope Leo is very much a Renaissance pope. And the Renaissance popes in this time are very, not very interested in theology at all. They're very interested in the arts. Uh, Raphael, Michelangelo, all those guys are being employed by the pope. In fact, Raphael, at the time, is uh, helping with the architectural stuff for St. Peter's. And so, but the Pope needs money to do this. And it just so happens that there's this guy named Albrecht. And Albrecht is already bishop of two areas in Germany, and he wants a third. He wants to be Archbishop of Mainz, which is the number one Catholic church job in Germany. It, it'll make him the top dog in Germany. And he really wants it. And he's really young, too. He's like 24. Well, Catholic church law says, well, you can only have two. You can only be bishop of two areas, so you can't have a third. But just like the Navy, anything is waverable. <laughs> and in this case, indulgences make it happen. So they work out a win-win. It's actually a win-win-win. So Pope Leo X will give the Archbishopric of Mainz to Albrecht. He'll allow him to do a plenary indulgence for sin, and Albrecht gets to keep 50% of the proceeds. And that's important because Albrecht has to borrow money to pay the Pope in the first place. So uh, he's going to pay the Pope, and then he gets to keep 50% of the proceeds to help him pay back the loan. Uh, what does the Pope receive? He gets 50% of the indulgence proceeds to pay off his own debts and help build St. Peter's. And he gets a power player in the bag for future elections. So the Holy Roman Emperor is not a hereditary position. It's elected. So when a Holy Roman Emperor dies... There are seven guys that get together to vote on the next guy. The king of Bohemia, and then three German princes, and three bishops. The Archbishop of Mainz is the number one Catholic church guy in Germany, is one of those electors. So if he gives this to Albrecht, he's basically got a vote in the bag for when the Holy Roman Emperor dies, who's the most important political figure in Europe. He, he actually has got a seat at the table to get the guy he wants elected. What does Albrecht give? Well, he gives, he allows the Pope to sell the indulgence in his territories, and he gives him 50% of the proceeds. What does he receive? The archbishopric and 50% of the dough. And the greatest thing is that the people that are buying the indulgence, they get out of purgatory. Win, win, win. Right? Who wouldn't love that deal? Luther. Luther. <laughs> Right? Luther has, I, I categorize his opposition to indulgences in three categories. One, personal. So Luther only went to Rome once when he was a monk. He went in 1510. He had to handle some business for his order. Uh, Luther was genuinely shocked. 
genuinely shocked by the lack of holiness in the holy city. Uh, he would see priests entering brothels. Uh, he would see priests making fun of uh, the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist while they were consecrating it. Uh, I mean, just completely blasphemous to Luther. He goes and he buys indulgences, because even in 1517, when he opposes indulgences, he actually isn't completely against them at the time. Luther buys an indulgence to free his grandfather, Heine, from purgatory. And uh, you can still do this in Rome to the state, my knowledge. And they're called the Holy Steps. Uh, there are 28 steps, and you kneel on each step, and you say some prayers after you, of course, person the indulgence. And you say, like, I think our fathers, and some other stuff, and then when you get to the top, that person is, you know, magically released from purgatory. And Luther says that he did this, and when he got to the top of it, he wondered in his head, who knows if this is true? Right, so he already had a bad personal experience with indulgences. Two, he had a theological problem. So he had just spent four years, so going to 1517, he had just spent four years teaching on Psalms, Romans, and Galatians. And it's during this time that Luther's really questioning church teaching when it comes to how are people saved. And he's got a real problem with the legitimacy of indulgences. Um, he hangs on to them for a little while, but of course he eventually completely uh, resent or you know, gets rid of any belief in them. And then pastoral. Luther's big, biggest problem, I'd say, with indulgences is the fact that it, it requires nothing of Christians. They go and they buy a piece of paper and they think they're fine. They don't think they have to live for God. And for this guy that's living in the monastery and he's suffering every day under the weight of his own sin, who, who knows what a struggle it is to walk after Christ, who daily thinks that he's going to go to hell and that God is a terrible judge, and people think they can just buy a piece of paper and they're safe. So he's got a huge pastoral concern with it. Yeah. Um, so you talk about how he's motivated by his not wanting to go to hell. Would you say, though, that the, it was primarily he brought all this about by his study of the scripture? Like if he, if he had that, if he still had this, or if someone else had that same um, fear of hell but didn't study the scriptures in the depth that he did, would you say that was like a necessary, because he was studying and he was like, this isn't in here, this isn't in here. Yeah, so I would say, so I would say if you're a person buying an indulgence, I'd say there are people, so this is a time in which lots of people fear hell, right? So even though there's a lot of destitute living, there is a resurgence, we didn't really get to talk about it in the previous centuries, of kind of lay monastic movements, people that aren't really uh, monastics, but they want to live that kind of life because they're really concerned about salvation as well. Um, again, Luther, even in 1517, doesn't say that indulgences are unbiblical. It's not until the next year when he goes to argue with Cardinal Cayetan in Augsburg that he says they have no scriptural warrant. But yeah, I mean, no one's studying the Bible, I would say at this time, like Luther is studying the Bible. Uh, and he's, you know, it's one of those things when you grow up in a received tradition and this is what you've been taught, you went to university, you got your doctorate on this, right? And then you're actually plunged into the scripture and it's changing your whole view of God. I think people kind of hold on to stuff for a little while. Right? It's, it's very few people that are very religious in one way that become religious in another completely get rid of everything on the same day. And Luther, you see in Luther clearly a progression starting really around 1515 and really ending at the beginning of the 1520s in which this transformation is happening. Uh, and the guy that's selling him too, L Luther really hates the guy that's, well, he doesn't hate, well, he probably did. The guy who's selling the indulgence in the area is a guy named... Um, Tetzel, Johann Tetzel. And Tetzel was a Dominican monk, and he had really catchy jingles, and I put those in your notes as well. Right? So every time a coin in the coffer rings, uh, uh, a soul from purgatory springs. Yep. Or he would say, can't you hear the voices of your, your burning parents saying, free us, free us from this torment? Very good indulgence salesman. Luther's prince actually won't let him in to his area, not because... He's selling indulgences, but because Luther's prince is actually doing some different stuff with indulgences, and he doesn't need another salesman peeling off his money. So anyway, Luther has these problems with indulgences. So what does Luther do? What any professor does. He writes a bunch of theses to have an academic debate, and he posts them to the door of the Schlosskirche in Wittenberg on October the 31st, 1517. So that was actually a standard practice? Yes. Yeah, church doors were like bulletin boards. 
So his would not have been the only thing out the door. It's, it's like the community bulletin board. And normally what would happen is, you know, a guy would post some theses, and someone would look at, would look at it, and they're like, okay, let's go have a debate about it. That, and that's exactly what Luther's wanting to do. He's wanting to have a debate with another theologian on indulgences. But that being said, he also mails them to the Archbishop of Mainz, Albrecht of indulgence fame. Uh, Luther is unaware of the politics behind indulgences at this time. So Luther forwards his 95 theses, and he says, hey, I just want you to know, Albrecht, this is what this guy's doing in your name. Well, Albrecht gets the letter and he goes, hmm, let's forward this to the Pope, which is what happens. Uh, the 95 Theses, again, you have these in your readings. They're composed in Latin. I gave you the English. Common University pra Practice for Advertising a Debate. He sent them to Archbishop. And this is what we consider the birthday of the Reformation. Whether it should actually be considered the birthday, we can let scholars debate, but this is really, this this sets the stage for the later great uh, of Luther and his movement with the Catholic Church. Yes? Any particular reason he posted them on the eve of All Saints Day? Um, not that I recall. Not that I recall. I mean, you gotta remember, everything's a feast day. He's named because he's born on the feast of St. Martin. So kind of the entire community calendar revolves around feasts. So I think by this point, I'd have to go look it back up, but there's a ridiculous number of feast days. I don't think it was, I don't think that it had any special significance. But again, I, I'd have to go back and check on that. Uh, but in the, in the fight household, 31 October is not Halloween, it is Reformation Day. And we watch <laughs> Martin Luther with Joseph Fiennes every October 31st. Uh, due to the printing press, the 95 Theses spread across Germany in only two weeks. Two weeks. Remember, we talked about before the printing press, you wrote a book. Someone had to write it out by hand a bunch of times, right? So if you wanted a Bible, it would take 11 months. The 95 Theses you could do in one day, but you'd have to have a bunch of guys writing it for a bunch of days, and then you'd have to send it by these communications paths that are really not great, and it would take, it'd take a while for your idea to get out there. Printing press, only about 60, 70 years old at this point. It, within two weeks, this is the hottest thing in Germany. Crazy. And it's important to note that when this happens, Luther is not trying to start the Reformation. He's trying to have a debate. That's really what's happening. He's, he's not like, yes, we're kicking this thing off. He's trying to course correct. And, well, it's, and he's not the first guy to want to course correct, is he? Yeah. God bless you, poor John Huss. <laughs> so let's ask that question. Why was it Luther instantly burned at the stake as a heretic like John Huss? The Catholic Church, the Catholic Church knows if you let these guys go on too long, then all of a sudden you have to go to war and end up losing the war and have to have a separate kind of church structure in a different country, right? Which is what happened with the Hussites. So why, why is it Luther instantly burned at the stake? He approached it very differently. I think, like he had these 95 theses, but he didn't go out and he, like he was trying to have a debate at, at first. Well, at first, he actually is far more, uh, reading Luther is never boring. He loves to insult people, and he's really, really good at it. Um, so in the beginning, yeah, the first 95 Theses, great. Uh, then a guy named Priarius, a Catholic theologian, responds, uh, and he makes the claim, this, this work is so ridiculous that I, I wrote this work in response in three days. And so when Luther gets it, Luther prints his own response, prints that guy's response with it on top, and he says... I did my response in two days. I mean, Luther's just... <laughs> uh, I think, I think uh, Carl Truman described him as a theological trench fighter. So, one of, the, one of the things that we do, we have a bad habit of, is we like to read about people in history, and we never go read them because we think it's going to be really difficult. Luther is super easy to read, and he's really fun to read. Um, because he, if you read his Bondage of the Will against Erasmus, Erasmus is the most famous public intellectual of his day. And Luther is treating him like he is the biggest idiot in the world. Pro and, you know, any other Christian today, if they read that, would be like, well, this is a very unchristian response. <laughs> Luther would say heresy is, is something that needs to be dealt with. And he dealt with it quite violently in writing. So why wasn't he burned? Really one guy, well, besides obviously the providence of the Lord. This guy, Frederick the Wise. Frederick the Wise is Luther's prince. Luther lives in a territory, so Germany is... 
Germany is not one solidified country like we know it. That's going to take 300 years after this before that happens. Uh, it's a bunch of different uh, principalities and such. Luther lives in a place called Electoral Saxony. And his prince is one of those seven guys that gets to vote for the emperor when he dies. So he's a very important dude. Um, Frederick... Yeah, we already talked about that. Frederick really liked Luther. Uh, we have no... That anyone has found. We, they obviously had to have seen each other, but there's no nothing in writing saying they ever spoke directly to each other. They always spoke through an intermediary uh, who was a friend of Luther's. But Frederick de Rais really liked Luther for no other reason than his university, the University of Wittenberg, had been founded in 1502. Uh, and what brings people to your university more than a controversial professor? So people are flocking into the University of Wittenberg after Luther releases the 1517 95 Theses. Uh, and as that whole thing goes on and Luther becomes more famous, the university gets more famous. And so Frederick de Wise says, no, 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 I'm not. So they, they say, hey, send him to Rome. And Frederick says, mm, no. I'll send him to Augsburg, which is also in Germany, and you can have a cardinal come question him there. Which is what happens a year later, October 1518. Luther is questioned in Augsburg by a guy named Cardinal Cayetan. If you've seen the Luther movie, and if you haven't, you definitely should. It is fantastic. Which one? The one with Joseph Fiennes. Yeah. So the one from like 2001, 2002. Yeah. The history of it is actually very, very good. Uh, most of the things that Luther says in the movie are things that he actually said in print. Uh, but Cardinal Cayetan, this, this meeting is shown in the movie. Uh, he's questioned. Uh, unlike in the movie, it actually lasts for three days. Cayetan repeatedly demanded for Luther to recant. Luther refused to do so. He bested Cayetan when it came to proving that, first off, indulgences are not an ancient practice. They're relatively new. They're not in scripture. They're an embarrassment to the church. And so Cayetan had direction from the Pope to actually arrest Luther if he refused to recant. Uh, they kind of find out about it. Stalpitz releases Luther from his monastic vows and says, you're not a monk anymore which is very important because under, under the law, as uh, Luther's um, monastic leader, he would be required to turn him over if ordered. And so he, being the only one that can, released him from his vows, and so he doesn't have to do that. And so Luther flees Oxford 30 October. So one year, one day shy of a year after the 95 Theses, goes back to Wittenberg, and again into the heartland of his prince's territory. Uh, in June and July, he gets into a famous debate in Leipzig with a guy named Johann Eck. That's supposed to be Luther on the left with his hand raised, and Johann Eck on the right. Uh, it's actually supposed to be a debate between Eck and Luther's colleague, a guy named Karlstadt. But Karlstadt's getting bested, and so Luther kind of jumps in, which is really what they wanted to happen anyway. So it's a two-week academic debate. That's legit. I would go to that. I don't know if any of you would, but I would go to that. I would be like, yes, did you see what he did there? <laughs> Oxford comma. Um, uh, yeah. But, so, and you gotta remember, there are no movies or anything, so this is, people do show up. It's not just, you know, the three of them. Uh, there are people there. There are people there. And Eck linked Luther to Huss, right? And if you link him to Huss, then you link him to heresy. Why? Because Huss is a condemned heretic. So Eck says, hey, Luther, your teaching is just like John Huss. At this point, Luther had not really read Huss, so he kind of adjourned for a day or two to go read Huss. Oh, which, yeah, it's all right. I'm going to go read all the Huss. I'll be back tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Roger, got it. Uh, Luther, after some research, declared that Huss was not a heretic. So that's all Johann Eck needed. Aha, he is a heretic, because he doesn't think Huss is one. And the debate showed that Luther was growing bolder in questioning the church's absolute claim to authority. Luther gradually goes from, hey, Pope, correct indulgences, to eventually, by 1520, 1521, to, uh, you know, the Pope is basically Antichrist. Uh, that being said, Luther tried really, really hard to get the Pope on his side for a few years. But Luther, Luther says, even in the Leipzig debate, he says, hey, Popes can err. History proves that they err. And guess what? Church councils can err, too. Right, because you had that whole conciliar movement that said, well, we don't think the Pope's infallible, but a church council's infallible. And Luther says, mm, the history proves that both of those things is untrue. 
the only thing that's infallible is the word of God. At this point uh, in the church history, the popes and the cardinals, do they still genuinely care about God and the Bible, or were they just... No, I would, say, I would say no. Were? No, I would say at, at, at this particular time, Leo X, definitely not. Leo X, I want to say, was made a cardinal as a teenager. Um, the Renaissance popes, so Alexander VI, who was pope when Luther was like a, kind of in like his junior high years, if you will. Alexander VI, a uh, guy with the last name Borgia, was famous for having several illegitimate children. They would have orgies in St. Lateran's Basilica, which is the, the, the which is actually the seat of the Pope. It's not actually St. Peter's, it's actually the, the Lateran Basilica. Um, the guy after him, a guy named Julius II, Julius II wanted to be a warrior more than he wanted to be Pope. In fact, Erasmus wrote a book about him in Praise of Folly, in which Julius II is in hell. Uh, and then Leo X is from a very rich Florentine family, the, the, Medi is the Medici. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so he comes from a very, very rich and politically connected family. So he's very, very interested in the arts, in architecture, in painting, in sculpture. Theology is not his bag. Wasn't and for most of them, it's not. Wasn't he the one that got Michelangelo to do chapel? Was that Leo? I think he started it. I think he started it. Definitely yeah. didn't finish under. Well, no, no, no. Wait. I think it, it finished it under. Yeah, it went. I'm sorry, I get my popes mixed up. It went sometimes. over a couple of them. You'll so, forgive me. So at this point, they they don't they know what they're doing. They they know they're holding positions of power, and that's what they want. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the Pope is a territorial ruler. And also, you got to remember, for them, the sacraments are the only thing that matter. Right? So it's, it's not about really preaching or edifying people to live godly lives. And of course, they would pay lip service to it. But I mean, they want the money coming in. They want the people to receive the sacrament. We're all good, right? That's how it's kind of always been, even though that's not how it's always been. That's what Luther's got a big problem with. Well, so the Pope issues a papal bull called Exerge Domini, Arise, O Lord. On 15 June 1520, it condemns six. It condemns, I want to say, 41 teachings of Luther, and it gives him 60 days to recant or be excommunicated. Right? To be excommunicated back then doesn't just mean that you keep, you know, you're not a part of the church anymore. It actually means that you're a fugitive of the law, and that people can basically do what they want to you. Uh, when Luther gets it, he burns it in a bonfire outside of Wittenberg which you see in that drawing right there. Uh, he, he said, because you have grieved the saints of the Lord, may eternal fire grieve you. He was clearly not afraid. So, the Pope, being true to his word, on January the 3rd, 1521, in another papal bull called Decet Romanum Pontificum, excommunicates Luther. Frederick, the prince, refuses to enforce it in Electoral Saxony, so Luther, you're going to be just fine. I'm not going to turn you over. And the new emperor, who's, who's basically 19 years old at this point, a guy named Charles V, say, okay, we need, we need to get a resolution of this before this thing gets out of hand, because a lot of people are following Luther. So he said, Let's, we have an annual meeting of all of the important politicians of the Holy Roman Emperor. It's called a Diet. So we're going to have the Diet of Augsburg in 1521. Let's actually hear Luther and hear what he has to say. Safe. Oh, and I'll give him a safe conduct, which means I won't burn him when he gets here. I'll actually let him say what he says. Who got a promise of a safe conduct, and it did not end well for him? Huss. Huss. Yes. Huss. The Holy Roman Emperor said, Huss, I, I promise you're safe. He said, well, I can probably trust that guy. Um, could not trust him. Uh, Luther, Luther thought, I think truly, that he was going to get the same treatment, and he went anyway. In fact, as he approached, as he approached Worms, uh, in April 1521, one of his followers came out of the city and met him on the road, and he said, Dr. Luther, you should not go in there. Right? I don't think it's going to go favorably for you. And Luther said, if there were as many devils as chimneys on the rooftop, I would still go to that place. Uh, absolutely fearless when it came to the Word of God. So he gets to the Diet of Worms. This is, this is really the seminal event of the Reformation. This is really, I think, where, where the break happens irrevocably. So April 16th, 1521. Oh, yeah, I already gave that one. Luther entered Worms. On April 17th, 
in front of the emperor and the nobility of the entire German nation, he was asked if he would recant. And he actually got scared for a second. And he said, hey, I'm going to need another day to consider. Because they laid out all of his books, and they say, do you renounce your works? And in a moment of hesitation, he said, I'm going to need a day to think about it. One day was all he needed. April 18th, he comes back. He was asked again if he would recount. Recant. Luther replied, since then, your serene majesty and your lordship seek a simple answer. I will give it in this manner, neither horned nor toothed. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures. I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against the conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other, may God help me, amen. And people debate whether he said here, the here I stand part. But he says, no, I will not recant. I will not recant. So a month later, on May 15th, the emperor issues what's called the Edict of Worms, which declares Luther to be a political outlaw. Charles V was very, very Catholic. In fact, Charles V is going to rule for over 30 years, and then he is going to actually resign as emperor to go live in a monastery. He's that Catholic. And when he passes the Edict of Worms, he says, I am therefore determined to use all my dominions, possessions, and friends, my body and blood, my life and soul to settle this matter. Right? Which means bad news for Luther. Well, I mean, the emperor's against him. He's issued an edict. Luther's as good as dead, right? I mean, he's a goner. Does Luther get burned? No. No, what happens? He's kidnapped. He gets kidnapped. Who kidnaps him? His own prince. His own prince kidnaps him and puts him in this sweet mountaintop castle called the Vartburg for ten months. He grows out a beard. He goes by Knight George. And he translates the Bible into German. Right? It took him three months to translate the Greek New Testament into German. And it was printed in 1522. Uh, Derek Wilson, in his biography of Luther, says that Luther's New Testament was the campaign manual of the Reformation. The Reformation, more than just a spiritual event, is a literary event. It standardizes language across the board. It does the same in England, does the same in France. Uh, what's really interesting to note is the Catholic Church is so vehemently against this position that, there is, that they do not allow translation of the Bible from Greek or from Latin into Italian until the 1700s. 1700s. Luther believed that the Bible was something that everyone should read. Right? The boy at his plow. Right? The, the theologian right? in his room. The shopkeeper in his shop. The Bible was God's word to everyone, and so it should be in the language of the people. And Luther really believed that. Didn't Tyndale visit him? Uh, Say it again? Didn't Tyndale? Tyndale did go. Mm -hmm. Tyndale did go. Not to, in the Vartburg, but to Wittenberg, sure. Yep. And, and Tyndale actually gets killed ten years before Luther dies. Uh, in fact, Luther, Luther and Calvin never meet, but they know of each other. In fact, Luther had favorable things to say about the first uh, edition of the Institutes, actually. Which um, is pretty legit. Pretty legit, I guess. Uh, when Luther's uh, commenting on your work. But he translates, the, he translates the Bible. Again, this is um, something that if you read his writings, he is, in the preface to his works, because you know, they published his works while he was alive, one out of every three books printed in the German language during his lifetime was written by him. One out of every three books in the entire German language was his. Uh, he took a great interest in his books. Uh, he was kind of like President Trump or President Obama. Right? Regardless of what you think of either of those gentlemen, they both had, in different ways, very intuitive, kind of an intuitive sense of how to use media to their advantage. Uh, Luther was the same way. He's the first guy to really leverage mass media, and he knew what book culture could do. And so in the preface to his works, he says, hey, I wish that no one would ever remember my name. I wish that they would read the Bible. And they would read the Bible, and they would read the Bible. Uh, Luther says, at one point, he says, hey, look, I've been teaching... I've been reading and teaching the scriptures for 30 years, and I find new stuff every day. Uh, he has a great quote about, you know, if the Bible is a tree, he goes shaking branches every day, 
right, to see what new fruit will fall from the tree. If anything, Luther loved the Bible. So anyway, publishes the New Testament 1522, goes, there's some problems in Wittenberg, people try to take his movement further than he likes, so he actually comes back in uh, 1522 and kind of reasserts his authority over the movement. What's interesting is, so I told you he's, well, he's, a, he's growing out his beard, he's pretending to be a knight, he actually goes to a tavern, right, uh, and there are two scholars, I heard this from Carl, I think it was Carl Truman, there are two scholars that are going to Wittenberg and they want to go study with Luther, and they, and they see this, um, this knight in this tavern reading uh, the Psalms in Hebrews. And so they, they end up, they just start talking to the guy. And the guy, uh, you know, starts, little did they know it's Luther. Uh, they're talking to the guy, and he doesn't reveal who he is. And they're just shocked at what this knight teaches them about the scriptures. Right? So they get to Wittenberg, uh, and like, you know, a few months later, all of a sudden, here comes, here comes that knight. Uh, into the uh, teaching lectern to teach them, and it's Martin Luther. So, um, and he bought their beer too. So, I'm sure they're not a fan of that. So no Luther, was, Luther was a fan of beer. If you yeah. didn't know. Did they know Luther was kidnapped and been in there? People? Uh, I, I would. I'm inclined to think no. If they were on their way to Pittsburgh to study with him, uh, but people didn't know that Luther was missing. So it was. I think it was common knowledge. Uh, later years. So. Uh, his movement kind of stalled in 1525. A bunch of the peasants said, hey, Luther's on our side. And they said, hey, let's go, let's go overturn all the political leadership. And if you know anything about Luther, Luther believes that God ordains all authority. Right? So even if you have a tyrannical king, it is your duty, right, to, as long as you're not being required to do something sinful, right, then it is your duty to obey. Well, that's so, in Romans. Huh? That's in Romans. That is in Romans, indeed. Uh, but it's going to be different, right, when we talk about the Reformed. Calvin would say... Well, what is ordained authority, right? It's, it, is it necessarily the king, or is it the, the legislature? Is it, and then some people are going to say, we don't owe any, you know, uh, any kind of allegiance to foreigners. So Anabaptists, for example, are going to say, hey, we owe zero allegiance to the state. So Luther is very much like, hey, uh, peasants bad. He writes a book called On the Thieving and Murdering Hordes of Peasants, which he tells the German nobility to kill all of the revolting peasants. 100,000 peasants die. It's a bad deal. Not a perfect guy. Uh, summer 1525, he marries a former nun, Catherine von Bora. She bore him six children, and she was just as feisty as he was. Uh, they wanted her to actually marry another guy, so there were like eight nuns that escaped from uh, Nimmingen, where they came from. Uh, and she was the last one, and they said, hey, we're going to marry her off to this guy. And she said, I'm not going to marry anyone but Dr. Luther. And Luther was like, well, I mean, I, I don't really love her, but I guess I'll marry her because... I said priests should be able to marry, and if I don't marry, then people are going to say forever that, well, Luther didn't get married, so he obviously didn't believe him. So in the beginning, it's kind of a marriage of convenience. They grow to genuinely love each other. The letters that he wrote, his wife, when he was gone, they're just beautiful. And he was, they were very, uh, they had a good back and forth, too. He would call, he would call uh, I think at one point he calls Katie the only pope he'll listen to or something like that. She brews his beer. Um, <laughs> They, they make some money, right, but they don't make a lot of money. You don't make money off your books back then. People just steal your book and they reprint it, and, and the publishers make all the money. So Martin Luther would actually, in his, in his free time, as ridiculous as that sounds, he would actually, him and his wife would do gardening around Wittenberg. So you could pay Martin Luther to be your gardener. Like, how crazy is that? Um, and he had no problem with that. Was she actually a redhead? Mm, I'm trying to remember what color hair she had. She was not, she was not a fan of that portrait. She, she thought uh, Lucas Cranach did not do her justice. <laughs> but I mean, I don't think she was in a special beauty. Uh, 1526, died of Spire, suspends the Edict of Worms, saying Luther's a heretic. Uh, 1529, we have what's called the Marburg Colloquy. Luther and the leader of the Reformed, a guy named Zwingli, who we'll talk about a little bit next week, um, and Calvin and all these other guys come more out of the Zwingli tradition. Uh, they had a big argument over the Lord's Supper because Martin Luther, even though he was against transubstantiation, he still believed that Jesus Christ was physically present in, in some way around the bread when it's consecrated. And Zwingli said, no, when Jesus says, this is my body, he means this represents my body, right? Just like when I say, these are my kids, oh, and that's a CNN update, these are my kids, it's not actually my kids, it's a representation to remind me of my kids. Uh, they go to Marburg. It, it looks like there's going to be a big split over this. A bunch of the Protestant princes bring them together and say, hey, we've got to agree. We've got to go be in lockstep against the Catholics. They agree on 14 and a half out of 15 theological points. 
But Luther will not budge. In fact, he carves into the table and he kind of hides it under a, a, a handkerchief. This is my body. And when Zwingli starts talking, he's like, aha! Um, it's just ridiculous. Uh, he, he really does that. I, he's, he did not think Zwingli was a Christian. L Luther would not have thought that anyone in this room is a Christian because of our view of the Lord's Supper. It was that important to him. Right? Uh, when, when Zwingli died on the battlefield in 1530 as a chaplain, he died, he got, he got stabbed to death. Uh, when news came to Luther, Luther said, that his exact words were, he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Not sympathetic to Zwingli. Uh, so the movement never unifies. And from that time forward, you have the Lutheran and you have the Reformed. Uh, March 1529, a new diet of Spire reinforces the Edict of Worms, the Lutheran Prince's Protest. That's where we get the term Protestant. Right? When we say Protestant, what does that mean? It means we're protesting. Okay, 500 years, we're still protesting, hopefully. We're good Protestants. June 1530, the Emperor allows the Lutherans to read their Confession of Faith, called the Augsburg Confession. 1531, the Lutheran Princes form a league to protect themselves against Catholics. What league is that? The Schmalkaldic League, from the town of Schmalkald. September 1534, he publishes the complete German Bible. So in 1522, it was the New Testament. He had to do the Old Testament after that. He did not do that in three months. Uh, it took him and a team a while to do that. In 1534, they published the whole thing. And then in 1546, Luther dies in Eisleben, which is actually the town of his birth. He was actually trying to solve a dispute between two brothers, uh, and he happened to be in the area. So a lot of stuff goes on this time that we don't really have time to talk about. Uh, again, Luther, three kind of things that he does really wrong that we should be like, you know, shame on you, Luther. One, the, the saying kill all the cousins, probably not a great idea, uh, led to terrible slaughter in Germany. Two, he writes a really favorable book about the Jews in 1523 called That Jesus Christ Was Born a Jew. And then 20 years later, 1543, he writes a terrible book uh, saying that the Jews should be basically, their synagogue should be burned to the ground and so on and so forth which Hitler was a big fan of that one. So Luther didn't say kill them all. He said, let's just take away all their stuff. Um, because Luther really thought that they were living at the end of the world and that the Jews needed to convert. And so in 1523, when the Reformation starts, he thinks, hey, they're all going to come because we're preaching the true gospel. And then when they didn't come, it very, very much made Luther mad at the Jews. So that's a terrible work. And then also, one of the Lutheran princes hated his wife and really couldn't get divorced, so he wanted to take a second wife. And he asked Luther, and Luther's like, well... You really shouldn't. And the guy's like, well, the patriarchs did. And he said, well, I don't really agree with that. But if you're going to do it, keep it secret. The letter got out. A on his face. Not good for Luther. All right, so real quick. How much of Luther's theology do you share? Do you think? Well, more than Luther. 14 and a half. Well, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully 14 and a half. Well, maybe a little bit less than that. So, some key things in Luther's theology. Justifi justification by faith. That's the heart of everything we do in the Protestant church. It's the heart of our belief system. Justification by faith. Okay? Justification was critical to Luther. That book I gave you, Freedom of a Christian, that's what it's about. He wrote that in 1520. Right? It's the year that he writes his three biggest works. And it's really about justification by faith. We have no hope of attaining salvation by our own. Right? Um, I don't have time to read all this. This is all in your notes. Luther, more than anyone up until this point, brings us back to the true gospel of justification by faith. That we are saved not by anything that we do, but, why, but what Christ does. Right? He believed in the theology of the cross, which goes with that. Okay? If we neglect, he said, if we neglect the truth of justification, we lose everything. Therefore, it is most necessary that we teach and repeat this above everything else. We cannot have justification urged upon us too often or too much. You have to repent and believe. And he's also known for, I like I said, the word of God, one of his quotes. He says, think of the scriptures as the loftiest and noblest of holy things, as the richest of minds, which can never be worked out, so that you may find the wisdom of God that he lays before you in such foolish and simple guise, in order that he may quench all pride. Here you will find the swaddling clothes and the manger in which Christ lays and which the angel points the shepherds. Amen to that. And then law and gospel. Uh, again, you have these in your notes. Um, there's a distinction between being under the law and being under the gospel. Um, he comes to, in his early life, he sees Christ as a terrible judge. 
and he comes to see, no, Christ saves us from those things in the law that we can never save from ourselves. We already talked about his belief in the Lord's Supper, which we do not share. And then two kingdoms. Hey, you belong to the Christian church. You also belong in the, church, in the, in the kingdom of the state. You owe obligations to both. So Luther is one of these guys we call one of the magisterial reformers. Just doesn't mean that his thought was so over everyone else. It means that he is accomplishing his reformation through the state, with the help of the state. They believe in that. Okay. It's a travesty that I had to teach Martin Luther in an hour. Questions, comments, or concerns? I'm so sad. A few things. Watch the Luther movie. It is worth it. I think you can watch it on Amazon Prime for like $3.99. It's from 2001, 2002. Joseph Fiennes, Academy Award nominated actor. It's actually got a bunch of really famous actors in it. The history is fantastic. It's very good. Uh, secondly, I know I gave you a lot of reading. If you're going to read anything in all of this class, Martin Luther should probably, besides the Bible, Martin Luther should definitely be what you read. Um, he is, like I said, he is not boring. It is, it is fantastic reading. All right, anything else? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you again for the opportunity to hear about your servant, Martin Luther, Lord God. I pray that we would love the scriptures as much as he, that you would prepare our hearts to hear the word preached from Brother John this morning, or if you've ever already heard those, that you would impress that teaching deeper, Lord God, that we would leave this place desiring to read the word, to teach the word, to proclaim the word, that gospel of justification by faith, that Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone, saves us from our sins, Lord God. Give us the, the courage of a Martin Luther to stand, though the whole world would condemn us, as long as we stand with Christ. In his holy name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you. Next week, John Calvin.